I have a word this morning, and I feel like the Lord has been wrestling this in me for some time, and these things manifest through sermons and different stops and through, I do a daily podcast, and so I'm always trying to take one step farther into uh, my understanding of things. So I want to take that journey with you today. If you would turn with me to the book of Matthew, let's get started in the Word. And I want to start with a sort of a proposition this morning. I want to lay in front of you a bit of a case uh, that comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew. And once we lay that case out, I sort of want to lay a case out in which I ask a question or two. They're rhetorical, but we're going to work through them together. And I think we can start to then, we'll switch gospel accounts because the gospels give us different glimpses into the life and ministry of Jesus. We'll switch gospel accounts, try to answer that question and, and see exactly what it is I think that the Lord might be saying to us through it. Go to Matthew chapter 20, verse 20, and I'll just read a few verses to sort of lay the framework for what I want to propose to you this morning. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons, Zebedee's, Zebedee's sons are... James and John. These are two of Jesus' disciples. Their mother comes to Jesus with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? And she said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. Now this is quite a request from mom, right? I would have been a little embarrassed if I was James and John this day uh, I'm running around with Jesus and my mom shows up and asks Jesus if someday I can sit at Jesus' right hand and my brother or whatever sit at his left hand and I probably would have said, Mom, we could have saved that uh, conversation for another time. Um, you know, we, we don't have to ask Jesus. Jesus got some big stuff going on. We could save that for another time. So I've always been curious that this even made it into the Bible because you know Jesus had all kinds of conversations that don't show up in the Gospels. So how did this one sneak into the canon? Well, I don't think there's a sneak to it. I, I, do, think that, I do think this comes from a fleshly place. Let's be honest. This, they're not looking for some spiritual elevated place. This is a fleshly place because this is going to stir up a stink among the disciples. They're all about to get into a big fight over who gets to be number one. And we're still fighting over that kind of stuff today in the church. Who gets to be the top dog? Who gets to be number one? Who gets to set up front? Blah, blah, blah. All, all that stuff. And, and Jesus is just as impressed with it today as he was back then, which means Jesus isn't impressed with it at all because it didn't move the heart of Jesus then. So why does this one make it in? I think it's because the Holy Spirit wants to show us something that's not only relevant to James and John, because how many of you know, if we were reading Bible stories and all the relevance was just to that audience, it's not going to do us much good reading the Bible. So the, the, the audience that he's speaking to then begins to permeate our consciousness. So whether you like the question or not today, I want you to make yourself James and John today, all right? Or, or, and, and that's not James and John as in I'm embarrassed that mom asked that, but James and John who might have elbowed mom and went, look, we can't ask, but you can. So go up there and find out if we can get sitting next to Jesus. We want to know where we're going to be in the kingdom. Jesus answered and said, notice he doesn't say, hey, that's a stupid question or, hey, that's a selfish question. But Jesus says, you don't know what you ask. Now watch Jesus turn a question back to them that I want you to ask yourself today. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said to him, we are able, which I think is pretty pretentious. Jesus says to you, you don't even know what I'm about to go through. Are you able to drink what I'm going to drink and be baptized? That means be immersed in, this isn't a water baptism. Are you able to take into yourself what I'm about to take in? Are you able to, be, to go through the fire that I'm about to go through? And they went, yeah, we can do that. We're, 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 we're perfectly capable of being able to do that. And Jesus says to them in verse 23, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. But to settle my right hand and my left is not mine to give. That's for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. Now, I don't want us to get distracted because I'm, I fear that's what happens sometimes when we read the gospel stories. We get distracted by the side point. You know what the side point is in this? Where you get to set in the kingdom. Right hand, left hand. What's it look like to sit on the right hand of Jesus? We'll do whole studies on what it would be like to sit on the right hand of the left hand or what's the seating chart in heaven or how do you earn your way up the ladder of what it looks like in the next realm or the next dimension. That's missing the point because the question 
Jesus counters the question with a better question. Their question is, where do I get to set the kingdom? Jesus asks a better question. Can you drink the cup, be baptized with the baptism? What you need to concentrate on is not where you end up in the kingdom. What I want you to concentrate on is what is required of you, what you participate in, what you partake of to be a member of that kingdom. And we can talk all day long about the goodness of God and where we're going and what we're receiving the kingdom and what, maybe even what heaven is like. But what really does us good as disciples of Christ? See, we're on our way to heaven, but what does us good as disciples of Christ in the kingdom is what do I do now to participate in what Jesus has done for me? The really easy answer is, Jesus did it all, you don't do anything, you just sat there. But the problem with the just sat there mentality is that we ignore the fact that we're drinking a cup and getting baptized in a baptism. And that's from Jesus' own mouth. Jesus doesn't say, hey, you want to sit on the right hand and the left? Don't do anything. Just believe. And when you get over there and you've believed, God will parse out where you get to sit. No, Jesus turns a question because he wants you to ask yourself that question. What does it look like to drink his cup? What is it to be baptized in his baptism? And if he asks them, maybe he's asking me, hey, Will you drink this cup? So my question back to Jesus is, I, I think James and John go, sure, we can drink it. I don't think they knew what they were saying. We can drink it. We can get baptized. I think my question to Jesus might be, I don't know what's in the cup. You know, what, what does getting baptized look like? And so the Gospels are then, I think, going to round out this argument and begin to show us what that is. So go to Luke 22. Remember, we told you that there are different glimpses of who Jesus is by looking in different Gospels. This is a side note to your Bible study that might help you as you walk through studying the Word. Don't look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as conflicting stories of the man Jesus because there's going to be moments where one Gospel says something and another Gospel shades it differently. It's going to look like a different argument. You go, see, the Bible doesn't agree with itself. Just remember that if four of you are witnesses to an event, none of your eyewitness accounts would be the same. You think they would, but forensic science has taught us, police science has taught us, detectives have taught us, four witnesses that view the same event never have the same statement. We see different sides to the same event. We get different shades. One witness to the crime goes, the guy was wearing a black shirt. The next witness to the crime goes, no, the guy was wearing a white shirt. You can't get farther apart on the color spectrum. How do we end up with one guy wearing one and one guy wearing another? Are, are one of you are lying? No. We see things through different lenses. And that, that, to me, that's what happens in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so that, that's just a side note on Bible study so that we don't get bogged down when we look at the Gospels. I want to take you into what is often referred to as the Last Supper, that moment where Jesus shares his heart with his disciples, and he does more than share his heart. He shares a meal with them. It's that meal that we take a glance at in Luke chapter 22, verse 14. When the hour had come, he sat down with the 12 apostles with him, and he said to them with a fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I want to take a pause for just a second. I want to point out a word that doesn't appear in the English, but is extremely powerful in the Greek. I, I know you realize that the New Testament wasn't written in English. It was translated into English, and sometimes we tamp down the words because they're just a little bit too wild. Here's a word that was a little bit too wild in the English. When Jesus says, it is with a fervent desire that I have desired to eat this meal with you, it's the exact same word that in a sexual connotation in the New Testament, we would have used the word lust. Had we been talking about sexual relations or fornication or adultery, the translators would have said, it is with great lust that I have lusted to eat this meal with you. But we have such a bad, a negative connotation in the English with the word lust that the translators changed it to desire because we can kind of clean desire up a little bit and go, well, his desire, desire is better than lust. If you'll allow me, I want to get rid of the word desire here and I want to go back to that, that word lust. Because think about what Jesus says to his disciples. I have been lusting for the moment when you and I get to share this meal together. This meal is so important that I have been thinking about it day and night for days. I couldn't wait to get in this room and share with you what it is I'm going to share with you. Now, this is what we often hear preached in communion. And I think when we minister communion, we ought to minister it with great fervency. We ought to minister it with great lust. 
I, I can't wait to take the body and the blood of Jesus because it's with great desire Jesus desired to take it with me. If Jesus desired to take the meal greatly with great lust with his disciples, imagine how great he feels to take it with you and I on the other side of resurrection. And so it's not just the taking of actual bread or, or actual wine or actual juice, but it's something else as well that's going on. 16, I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He took the cup, he gave thanks, and he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. What did James and John's mom say? Hey, can my kids sit on your right hand your left? What did Jesus say? Are you able to take the cup and drink it? Remember that? They said, yeah. He goes, sure you can. Look at what he's offering them. Jesus slides a cup across the table. Remember, he's already asked the disciples, are they going to be able to drink that cup? Sure we can. Jesus goes, you're right, you will. Still not mine to give who sits on the right hand and the left. I'm not here to give you the particulars of where you're going to land in the kingdom of God, but I will tell you, you can participate in it. You can drink that cup in. I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Notice I won't eat the bread until the bread's fulfilled in the kingdom, and I won't drink the cup until the kingdom of God comes. And so I want to ask you this question, when and where is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is not a place on the other side of cosmic Jordan. When you die, you ferry across the river and move over into the kingdom of God. How do I know? Because Jesus said, I will not eat and I will not drink until I'm in the kingdom. In Acts chapter 10, Peter goes to the house of Cornelius and he preaches the gospel to the Italian Cornelius, a Gentile. Remember this moment? And during that sermon, Peter says to them, we saw Jesus resurrected and we sat and ate and drank with him. Now hear that. We saw Jesus resurrected and we sat and ate and drank with him after he was resurrected. Jesus told us in Luke 22, I will not eat and I will not drink until I'm in the kingdom. In Acts 10, I ate and I drank with Jesus post-resurrection. Where must Jesus have been? In the kingdom. Where was that? Here. So guess what? The kingdom of God, just as Jesus said it was, has come upon you. And you get to actively participate in the body and the blood of the kingdom of God, not someday over yonder, but right now begin to inherit what belongs to you. So if you say, hey, I, what I love about the kingdom teaching, Pastor, is that we have an inheritance and we get to walk into the fullness of that inheritance someday. And for far too long in the church, we've relegated our inheritance to what we get over there, over yonder. And have you noticed that what we get over there, over yonder, starts to look like what we like over here? Just the best version of it. Big house, green grass, picket fence, all my dead pets, everything's over there waiting for me because I'm over there in that place called glory land. And in reality, we've just transposed what we think of as pleasure and success and wealth down here, and we've stuck it way over there somewhere in the glory land. The reality is, is God didn't come to make a clear path for you to get to heaven. God come to clear a path to bring heaven to you. Because what God wanted to do was offer you, this is the key, God wanted to offer you the step into your inheritance now so that you could begin to partake and participate in whatever it is Jesus had paid for, and you don't have to wait till you die to do that, you get to do that now. See, that to me, that's the essence of the gospel. For far too long the gospel has been the ministry, and I, I said this when we were here in June, but I want to repeat it. Uh, that for far too long the gospel's been the ministry of what we avoid when we die and what we get when we die, rather than I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundant, that I am here to participate in the life of God now. If I were to wait to participate on the kingdom, now this is a practical analogy. If I were, if I were required to wait to participate in the kingdom, then Jesus could not have eaten the bread and drank the cup after he resurrected with his disciples because he had already declared, I will not do this again until I'm in the kingdom. And then at resurrection, when he participates, what he has done is he's moved the perception of the kingdom both down here and he's taken it out of the realm of it's going to be something I see, touch, feel and moved it into the realm of something I'm going to have to understand by revelation. Because can you imagine how Peter, James and John felt when Jesus resurrected Jesus, started eating the bread and drinking the cup and they thought, he told us he wasn't going to do that to you, he was in the kingdom. Oh, wait a minute. 
We must be in the kingdom. Wait a minute. The kingdom must not look like we thought it was going to look. The kingdom must not be like Rome and Caesar and armies and kings. The kingdom must be something else that we walk into by revelation that we live out instead of living in. All right? And so as we watch Jesus participate in this and partake of this, this is the beauty of it. Jesus slides the cup across the table. He slides the bread across the table. He says, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Take, drink, this is the cup. But look at what he calls it. This is the cup, verse 20. He took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Hear that. This cup is is the new covenant. Whatever's inside of that cup is God's new covenant. Not an old covenant. It's not a side covenant. It's not a future covenant. It's the new covenant. So when the, the writers of the New Testament begin to expound and elaborate on the new covenant, this is what they're talking about. Birthed when Jesus shares what he's going to accomplish in the kingdom with us, and we get to take that cup in. Now, I think this is why when James and John say, sure, we can drink the cup, Jesus says, you bet you will. I don't think what he meant was you're going to die a martyr's death. That's how we've interpreted that. Because John doesn't die a martyr's death. John dies an old man. Remember the Isle of Patmos? So when Jesus says drink the cup, he's not talking about people losing their lives in the natural. He's talking about something else. So taking into us, yes, indeed, we get to take into us whatever Jesus took into him. He becomes the active participant in a covenant with his father. So think in these terms. Israel entered a covenant with God at Sinai. They get to the edge of Mount Sinai. God gives them the Ten Commandments. He gives them the law, what Paul would call the ministry of death written and engraved on stones. Why does Paul call the Old Testament the ministry of death? Because if you continue to minister law to people, you'll kill them. There's no other. To me, that's the simplest explanation. Tell people do and don't, do and don't, do and don't. You'll kill their joy. You'll kill their life. You'll kill their spark. Eventually, they'll want to quit altogether. And what we've done for too long in the church is go, well, the reason you're wanting to quit is because the devil, he's convinced you to give up on God and backslide. And the reality is we've ministered so much death to them, there's nothing left but being condemned. They come in, they're just condemned all the time because all we've told them is jump, 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 jump higher. Got to work harder. God's not happy with you. God's mad at you. That's a ministry of death. It'll kill people. It, may not, it won't happen right away. In fact, the opposite will happen right away. The moment you give people the law, they'll kick into gear and start working because the law kicks people into gear and gets them working. But what it doesn't show them is the way off the treadmill. So they're, it's, like, it's like the first day you join a gym versus the 30th day of you joining the gym. The 31st day you've already revoked your gym membership. You went, man, I can do more with that twenty nine ninety nine that I was doing, you know last month I, or it's the day you buy that treadmill and you've got that room for it and you've redesigned it put that rubber mat down hung your tv on the wall and you're going to do all this running and then it becomes a clothes hanger for all the clothes you're drying you can't even get to it anymore owning a home treadmill is like owning a boat the best two days in a home in a boat owner's life is the day he buys it and the day he sells it right Day he buys it, I'm going to be on this thing all the time. Day he sells it, goes, thank God, I don't have to fix that engine anymore. That's what the law does, though. The law, it's sort of this inspirational thing. I get fired up because I'm going to do this. And then you don't, you can't, you can't, because no one told you that you're not allowed to shut it off. You have to keep running. And no one's excited about that, no matter how good a shape you're in, because you can only run so long, and then you're exhausted, and you fall off, and then you don't ever want to get back on again. And the, and the landscape of the human existence is littered with the bones of people who came into church, got ministered to by the ministry of death and condemnation, and then they fell off the treadmill, and they went, I'm never going back. If that's what God expects of me, then I'm just going to do the best I can, cross my fingers, hope I get home. And I just want to minister to them, no, there's something so much better for you. It's called take and taste and see that the Lord is good by drinking the cup of the new covenant and take into yourself what Jesus took into himself so that you can realize it was never about you. It was always about Christ in you. You can receive that. You can walk that out. 
So Jesus doesn't just drink the cup, he invites them to drink the cup. So what does that look like? Because here's the reality is I don't really participate in the new covenant. I don't have anything to do with it, neither do you. When God gave that old covenant to Israel, it was do and get, do good, get good. When God gives the new covenant, who did he give it to? He gave it first to Jesus. Because Jesus says this is my blood of a new covenant. It's not your blood. See, under the old covenant, God wanted the blood of a lamb, which was a representative of you. And do you know why you had to sacrifice lambs every time you sinned? Because they weren't enough. And do you know why they weren't enough? Because we're not enough. My effort isn't enough. I can't keep my end of the bargain. The new covenant focuses on Jesus. Jesus fulfills the law to perfection. And how do you fulfill the law to perfection? You fulfill the law by loving your neighbor, by loving your enemy, by not resisting the evil one, the evil person, by, by turning the other cheek, by carrying the load that extra mile. You do that as a fulfillment of the law and as that law is fulfilled Jesus becomes the the benchmark by which we view the new covenant and so then we get to part we get to become a part of that I want to try to parse a couple of phrases here for you I don't think you participate in making the new covenant happen because the reality is is what are you going to do the new covenant's not with you it's with Jesus but you partake in the new covenant because of the Christ that you have, because of who is in you. In fact, Paul said this in Colossians 1.12, he has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance. Listen to that. He has qualified me to be a partaker in the inheritance. Why am I qualified? Because of faith in Jesus Christ. Not because of my actions, but because I believe in a man named Jesus, and therefore I'm qualified. That's me drinking of that cup. Sneak down into Luke 22. I left you in that chapter because there was one more moment I want you to see as we go down into the Garden of Gethsemane in chapter, 42, or chapter 22, verse 42. Father, Jesus says this, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And this is an interesting curveball in our drink the cup passage because here's Jesus saying, Dad, now, Jesus is sweating, as it were, great drops of blood. He's agonizing in the garden. He's about to be arrested and go before Pilate. He will die tonight in this chronologi chronological telling of the story. And he knows it. He says to the Father, Father, if there's another way for us to accomplish this that we need to accomplish, to pay for men and women, to enter them into a covenant, if there's another way rather than drinking the cup that I'm about to drink, let's do that. Because what I'm about to do is impossible for you to ask any human to do. Now, for a long time, I read the, this moment where Jesus asked for the cup to pass, and I thought, Jesus was being like us. He didn't want to go suffer death. But I'm not so sure that's why Jesus wanted the cup to pass. I want to say to you today, I think the most difficult thing about the cross is the thing we overlook. Jesus is not scared, or frightened, or afraid in the terms that we are. But Jesus is trepidatious before he goes to the cross and asks God, if there's another way to do it, let's do it. And I don't think it's because he's going to bear your sins in his body. I know it's not because he thinks his God's going to turn his back on him. I don't believe God turned his back on his son at the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? was not Jesus saying, hey God, where are you? It, was you? it was God telling you where to go read in the Bible to find out what was happening to him because that's a song in the song book of Israel called the book of Psalms chapter 22. And in Psalms 22, you'll find that, Jesus, that the prophecy says, I will not turn my face away from my own. Which tells me that at Calvary, God didn't turn his back on Jesus. So Jesus isn't saying, hey, is there another way we can do this because I'm scared you're going to leave me. No, I truly believe Jesus says to the Father, I, if there's another way to do this than drinking this cup, it's because what Jesus is asked to do at Calvary is the most impossible thing for a human being to do. Jesus is asked to forgive the people that are killing him. The hardest thing for us to do is love people that hate us. Everyone in this room is shaking their head. You know why? Because we've all lived that out. It's easy to love people that treat you good. It's easy to love people that love you. It's difficult to love people that hate you, that work against you, that spitefully use you. It's difficult to be patient with people you disagree with. Oh, everyone should amen that. It's an election year. And you all have Facebook pages. And you're throwing fisticuffs at fake people all day long with responses and comments because that's what's happening and 
what, what, what's, what, what is the most difficult thing in the world is to find common ground with people that we have no common ground with. And Jesus says, Dad, if there's a way if we could do this without me forgiving Romans and forgiving high priests. I mean, ha, ha, Pastor Paul, why do you think that? Because Jesus articulates, listen, I got, I got 10,000 angels waiting to come and take me off this cross. It's always there in his head. You know why, you, why, why, why thousands? Couldn't he just have one to take him off? Sure, he could have one to take him off, but you're going to need 10,000 want to take all of Rome down. That's what's on the table. See, I can save the world with a sword. I can save the world by bringing all of heaven down here and conquering earth. Dad, could we do it that way? If not, I'll drink this cup. Listen, church, drinking the cup of the new covenant is taking in the thing that Jesus took in. Loving people. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Why must I say this? Because it isn't easy being human. It isn't easy doing what they do. It isn't easy to hang here and not respond with vitriol and hatred and vengeance and revenge. This is the most difficult thing in the whole world to do, is to drink the cup of a man who has to take abuse and not respond. That's the hardest cup on the planet to drink, is to be asked to receive into yourself venom and hatred. That's so difficult for us. Most of us on the face admit that we don't know how to do it. We just admit it. I can't take it when someone says something like that to me. I've got to let them know the truth because I'm not going to get run over. That's, what, that's, a, that's an easy way, right? Why is it so difficult to be the other way? Because it's drinking the cup that Jesus slides across the table. And he asks you before you drink it. He goes, are you sure you can drink this? And James and John go, sure we can. Jesus goes, yeah, you can. You can. Listen, no matter how you answered it, Jesus answers for you. You can. I, I didn't say it's going to be easy to drink it, but you can. And I invite you to, because you want to know what's inside of it? What the new covenant looks like? What's inside of it is the inheritance of the heavens. What's inside of it is ruling and reigning with me, and I don't reign with a sword in my hand. What's inside of it is when your accuser comes to you with a sword in the Garden of Gethsemane, you have to put his ear back on his head. You don't get to take his other ear off. There it is. That's the new covenant in that cup. What's it look like to drink it? What's it look like to participate or to partake in it? Look at Romans chapter 8, if you would, for a moment. I want to take you to two passages in Romans as we try to land this this morning. Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul talking in verse number 12, and I'm going to read slightly more than I need, okay, to give you context to get us into this, because this tenders our heart. These are exciting verses about who we are in Christ. And so watch this from verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we're debtors. If you've never underlined this word in your Bible, please do so. You are a debtor. You owe somebody something. I want you to start with that premise. I'm a debtor. Who do I owe? Here's the problem. In Christianity, we've been telling people they owe God. If you owe God, then you're not a free recipient of the new covenant. You're a paying participant in the new covenant. You pay God with your time, your tithe, your study, your evangelism, your missions work, your righteousness, your holiness. I'm here to present to you, you don't owe God anything. You are not a debtor to God, but the text says you're a debtor. So who is it that you owe, and why would you owe anything? If you're into a covenant in which you don't owe God, who could you possibly owe? I think you might have an idea, because I told you drinking the cup costs you something, because drinking the cup might cost you the rebuttal and the reply that you want to give, but welcome to the new covenant where there is a debt that you owe, and what does that debt look like? The, we are debtors. Not to the flesh. It's not natural money, time, effort, stuff, lands, possessions, properties. If you live according to the flesh, you die. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you live. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. You didn't receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. You received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry out, Abba or Daddy, Father, because the Holy Spirit in me gives me the right to call God my dad or my father. Here's why, because the Spirit himself 
bears witness with my spirit that I'm the children of God. And if we're children, look at this, then we're heirs, we're heirs of God, and we're joint heirs with Christ. Stop right there for a moment. You're heirs of God, you're joint heirs with Christ. Whatever Jesus receives, you receive. Why? Because Jesus entered into a covenant with his Father, and what was Jesus' end of the covenant? Drink the cup. Dad, could we do it another way? If we can do it, if we can cut covenant another way, let's cut covenant another way. But if not, I'll drink the cup. He drinks the cup. What's the cup? Inside of that cup is Calvary and what it costs. Inside of that cup is forgiving your accuser. Inside of that cup is loving the unlovable. Inside of that cup is hanging at Calvary when you got 10,000 angels that could pull you off the cross, but you don't do it. Why? Because you drank that cup and you receive that cup, and that's Jesus saying to us, you're a joint heir with me. Here's the beauty. You don't owe anything to God, but you do owe because you have an inheritance. It's just not God you owe. If, indeed, we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. What's the suffering with him that's part of my debt? Chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 Verse 8, you want to see what you owe? Remember, you're a debtor and you're a joint heir. You're both a joint heir and a debtor. 13, 8, owe no one anything except, here it is, whatever comes after except is my debt. This is what makes me a debtor. Owe no man anything except to love one another. That's it. Listen, that's the cup. That's what you signed up for. That's your participation in the new covenant. I am one of the king's sons. I'm a joint heir with Jesus. I have what Jesus has. But I also have the same responsibility Jesus had. Oh, walking on water, feeding 5,000, raising the dead, healing the sick. Okay. Maybe the one we're not so excited about. The one called loving your neighbor is the fulfillment of the law. I have been riding this horse sermon to sermon to sermon through different scriptures, thoughts, concepts for months. It's the thing that consumes my night and my day. I've been in the church my entire life. I've been in ministry 27 years. I, I don't claim to have accomplished much of anything or learned much of anything. So I'm always wrestling out, what is this about? What are we doing and why are we doing it? It's not just to go around the sun one more time. It's not just to go into another church and minister. It's not just to share this or write another book. And what I keep spinning back to in this season of my life is watching Jesus function on the earth as a man. And the difficulty that it is in being Jesus is that he doesn't get to respond to people the way it's the easiest to respond to them. He doesn't get to just say to them whatever's on his mind. He doesn't get to say to them exactly what he sees. He has to listen to what his father says, and this is your requirement, church. You have to listen to what your father says about your neighbor and say what your father says about your neighbor, not just what you would say about your neighbor, and it's the great debt that we owe. It's the great debt of love that we owe in, in, who, in walking this out with him and walking this out with who he is. I want to read you one more verse, John chapter 8, and this was, not, this was actually one that just popped up in my spirit as I'm closing this. It's not one that I had in mind, but it, it just kind of screams at me, and I was dealing with this in our Tuesday Bible study in Georgia several months ago as we worked through every verse in John. Look at John chapter 8, and look at verses 25 and 26. And we'll close because I want you to think about what it is that Jesus sees versus what it is that Jesus says. They said to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, just what I've been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you. But he who sent me is true. Just, just stare at the first half of that verse, if you would, for a second. Look at what Jesus said. I have a whole lot I'd like to say about you, but the one who sent me knows the truth about you. 
Let me, let me break that down slowly again because that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a head full right there. Jesus says, you know what I see when I look at you? Stuff. Junk. You know who's confronting? Jesus has just been confronted with a bunch of guys that want to stone a woman caught in the act of adultery. And Jesus said, he without sin among you cast the first stone. And do you think, that had to fire him up. That kind of judgmentalness. And Jesus says, I have a lot of stuff I want to say about you right now. But the one that sent me is true. If Jesus had to do this, I think Paul has to do this. I mean, I think if Jesus needed this verse, I need this verse, which is, I have stuff, when I watch the lives of people around me, I have stuff I think I should probably say to them. <laughs> Clean some of that up. Take care of some of this stuff. I'll, you, don't, you don't see it? Well, I'll show you. And how many of you know that's what's happened in ministry a lot, is that ministry has made themselves the magnifying glass of heaven to point out whatever's wrong with people and just point that on to them on Sunday and then go, okay, get up here and let's let Jesus take care of it. Jesus says, I have a lot of stuff I'd say to you, but I also have one who's true. Now, I'm not going to read anything into what Jesus says. I just put it there. You take it and run with it. What it says to me is, it ain't easy to speak to people the way God sees them. It is easy to speak to people the way you see them. So how I see you today doesn't matter. Because if I stare at you long enough, I can find reasons to tell you something I think you should change. And you could reciprocate and do the exact same thing to me. And we could just go down this spiral of both of us trying to fix each other all the time, and we don't do anything but get mad and fight one another. And that's what's happening in our communities. That's what's happening in society is the right wants to fix the left, and the left wants to fix the right, and the Republicans want to fix the Democrats, and the Democrats want to fi fix the Republicans, and the people in the middle want to fix both sides, and both sides want to fix the middle, and everybody's got each other in their sights on what's wrong with so-and-so on the other side of the aisle. And it's not working, is it? It never will. I don't know when we're going to learn that. I don't think we're ever going to learn that. It, it doesn't work that way. But what I know is that my heavenly father sees you through the lens of his son. And in seeing you through the lens of his son, he says, aren't they beautiful? Look at them. Aren't they wonderful? All of us, both sides of the aisle, donkeys and elephants. Doesn't matter. He looks down and he says, aren't they beautiful? I love them. They're my kids. Keep your mouth off of my kids. I think that's what the father is saying. Keep your mouth off of my kids. I love them. And we, what do we do with that? We just argue. We just sit back and go, well, they're not all God's children, bless God. Some of them are sons of the devil, and I can point out the ones that are. You ought to tell those people what's wrong with them. How are they ever going to get saved if you don't? Listen. You gave up that right when you drank the cup. Okay? You gave that up when you drank the cup. Jesus said, can you drink it? And they go, sure, we can drink it. And he goes, you're right, you can. You can. But drinking it costs something you're not ready for. You'll be ready for it someday. He goes, you will indeed drink it. You will indeed drink it. There is a cost to it. I'm a joint heir with Jesus, but I'm also a debtor. You know who I don't owe? God. You know who I do owe? You. That's why I'm up here today, because I owe you, because I owe Dan Morrison, because I owe Living Word Church, because I owe every person who puts trust and confidence that they're going to hear the voice of the Father when I open my mouth. I owe them. I think about them. I wrestle over them. I pray over them. I long for them. This man's heart owes you. That's why I told you what I told you at the beginning. Because he doesn't take that ceremonially, he doesn't take that as, as something to be held lightly, but serious. And you owe the man next to you, and the co-worker, and the neighbor across the street, and the guy you can do nothing but fight with. You don't owe God, but you do owe this world. So my encouragement is go live as if you owe God nothing, and you owe your neighbor everything. And watch us change the world by owing our neighbor everything.
and owing our Father nothing and just receive. Father, I thank you that I don't owe you a dime today. How can I pay you if I did owe you? You have died on my behalf. You have suffered for me. I can't pay you for the kingdom. I don't, I don't buy a right-hand seat or a left-hand seat. That stuff's up to you. I'm not a debtor to heaven, and heaven's not a debtor to me. I'm a joint heir with Christ, and everything heaven has, I have. But Father, thank you for the painful revelation that I do owe a debt of love to my neighbor, that I do owe a debt of love to those who are in this world, and the only way true change is going to happen is not the next election. The only way true change is going to happen is if I figure out I owe my fellow man the love that is in my heart given to me by Jesus. And as Jesus said, I say over this church in this prayer, Father, as Jesus said, this is a new commandment that I give unto you. Love one another as I have loved you. Father, give us a revelation of how loved we are all over this room right now. Because it is useless for us to get excited and rah-rah about loving our neighbor if we don't know how loved we are. A revelation of how loved we are so that we give that love to the world in Jesus' name. And if you receive that, say amen. God bless you, Living Word Church. I love you. We'll see you soon.